I'm very happy to have you here. We are very happy to have uh, your band here. And um, but before we went to topics that are more cur current, I want to ask you because most of uh, most of rock and roll musicians, when you ask them why did they pick up their instruments, they'll give you an honest answer that it was because of the girls, because of the rock and roll lifestyle, uh, because of the splendor. Uh, why did you start from a position of a producer and an engineer, which is way more, way less glamorous? What's was the motivation, inspiration behind that? Um, the, the the main uh, the main thrust of the uh, desire to go and play live was to was to promote an album. It was the, the first the first album I'd done as Alan Parsons, as opposed to the Alan Parsons Project. And I, uh, you know, I had a background as a as a guitar player. I played in a, I played in a blues band. I um, I played in uh, pop bands at school, so I mean, I, I was a reasonable guitar player. Um, and it just seemed uh, the right thing to do to step on the other side of the on the other side of the fence from being a an engineer and producer and, and, and uh, take the plunge and go and play live for the first time. Were the beginnings difficult in a way? Because again, that was a totally different environment. Even if you started with uh, mm, smaller bands when you were younger. Uh, at that point, you already had a name and expectations. Were you kind of anxious when it came to thinking about being able to meet them? At this very I, I, I knew I, I knew I was no virtuoso. I mean, I, I'm not uh, I, 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 to this day. I'm no I'm no virtuoso. But uh, I surrounded myself with great players. Uh, Ian Benson, the guitar player who had uh, played on all the records uh, with the Alan Parsons Project, Stuart Elliott, who had done most of them. Um, Andrew Powell, who'd done all the orchestral arrangement, he, he went on keyboards. And uh, we just uh, decided that uh, I could dust off my guitar and, and, and play rhythm guitar and uh, do a bit of backing vocals. And uh, we, we got uh, Chris Thompson from uh, Manfred Manzo's band um, and uh, one of the, uh, oh my goodness, I've forgotten the name of the band, the... Uh, it's an a cappella group from uh, from Britain. Um, no, anyway, I'm sorry. The, anyway, we assembled this band uh, with with Chris Chris Thompson uh, uh, as the main one of the main vocalists, and um, the other guy's name was Gary. <laughs> and um, we we did a tour of Germany, uh, and it went really well. And uh, basically, I've been doing it ever since with different incarnations. I I, I divorced and moved to America in. Uh, in uh, 1999, and uh, then I formed an American band uh, with, with all American mu musicians. But uh, there's been a sort of rotating uh, set of uh, musicians that I've been playing with since then. There, there was always lots of talk about the differences between American and British musicians. Was there a noticeable difference when you went there and picked players from this uh, country? I, I think the... Um, the essential style was the same. I mean, but yes, I mean, American American players have a a, a different attitude, a different uh, a different style. But the the um, you know, I, I strived to make all all the inclinations of the band to to sound as much as possible like the records, and I, I still do that. Being a head of a, such a big band, actually, a big band is a really good name here. Even <laughs> if you look into like the definition, not only literally but uh, figuratively, figuratively as well. Um, is it hard to basically conduct such a large group of musicians? Does it require some kind of a specific approach to discipline, to uh, to control, to organize them as a unit? Well, they are musicians. They are rock musicians. So you have to you have to uh, have to make a, make uh, you know be be a, like a schoolmaster sometimes. But um, generally speaking, they're they're very professional guys. They they all have a job to do. They like to do it as best they can, and um, we we I think we just work as a team more 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 than me being the the boss that's in charge of everything. But uh, you know, like I said, occasionally I will point out you know this this doesn't work. Try this. Try that. Just, just like I would in the studio as a producer. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good moment to come back for a moment to your producing days. Uh, there's one thing that I've been thinking about recently. Uh, back in, let's say, 60s, 70s, uh, the idea of a rock producer 
was totally different than nowadays, I think. It was a name, it was actually a brand that was as strongly attached to uh, the band's sound, to certain album sound, as it was the names of musicians, basically. Like people like Philip Spector, obviously like you, people like, uh, even later, like in the 90s, people like, like, like Rick Rubin, when an album produced by a, such an important and charismatic figure uh, was put on the market, it was just like a, it was equally important as musicians, as I mentioned. Nowadays, it seems kind of different, and at least in terms of rock music, it's kind of the persona of the producer has vanished. Do you think there's any reason behind that? Um, I wouldn't agree with that totally. I, I think um, I mean, you mentioned Rick Rubin. He's, he's a huge name still to, to, to this day. Um, I was there, I was in there in the early days of the producer being recognized. Um, and also, of course, um, the engineer being recognized. I mean, the, uh, when I first started, en engineers were only credited on rare occasions. Um, and the producer was just a line of small print. You know. But um, because of what the Alan Parsons project was, I was the, the, main, uh, you know, the, main, the main name that uh, was associated with, with the Alan Parsons project. And uh, that kind of, uh, that was, that was a new thing. It was a new thing. It was the first time that a, I think that a producer had been, with the possible exception of Phil Spector, who you also mentioned. Phil Spector, you know, was a was a big name in his own right. But I was the first producer to, to, to I think uh, have a band per se, mm -hmm. and to uh, uh, have a manager. I, I actually had it. You know, I actually producers were normally just hired guns from uh, from record labels, but uh, I actually had a manager and. So I had uh, negotiating power for the first time. Uh, still, though, I think that your name is actually very, very strongly attached to, well, obviously Pink Floyd albums, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, on the other hand, I don't know um, how much you follow today's music industry, like uh, let's say newer bands or newer artists. Uh, I've noticed at the same time that, as I said, this name of this idea of a producer is not as strongly associated with rock acts. On the other hand, uh, when you look at many of the bigger pop stars, actually, they introduce themselves as producers, like people like Kanye West or Tim Blunt. They're basically pop singers, rappers, etc., etc., who actually call themselves producers. And when you, for example, look at um, credits underneath many of those albums, popular album songs, they have large groups, groups of producers who are usually also songwriters. Uh, now my question is, uh, do you have any opinion on this state of things? And secondly, like, uh, do you think you would be able to f find yourself comfortable in a reality like that if you were a young producer and you would have to uh, basically um, commit to such a role? I mean, you're talking about the hip hop and uh, rap kind of market generally, I think. It's popular um, music market, and mm. you used okay, to. Okay, well, yes, mainstream, what yeah, is now mainstream. mainstream. Yeah, what we call mainstream. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm, of course, very pleased when uh, the likes of Kanye West and, uh, uh, and these guys uh, choose to sample my music. That's great. Um, and uh, I, uh, I'm slightly reluctant to, to do um, the kind of production which involves that many people. I mean, you see, you know, on, on a single song, you might see, if, you know, seven or eight names. Yeah, and that's, uh, exactly and that's, not, that's not only financially crippling, <laughs> it's, uh, okay, it's, 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 it's also, uh, you know, it, it takes away the credit from the, from the wh whoever the main, the main man is. And I, I'm, I'm quite happy to rem remain the producer and uh, not, not, not involve any other. Other people. I have a, I have a great uh, computer operator engineer uh, that I work with, um, but beyond that, I don't. I, I, I stick to uh, to being the the main producer and collaborate with the songwriting and, and so on. Um, I've got one more question that I think is uh, kind of interesting. I would really like to know your insight on that because, as someone who's been uh, part of the industry, who has observed it for over 50 years. Uh, I really wonder how. Fifty years. Woo yeah, that's that's quite a lot. Uh, uh, well, you look younger than me on Sunday mornings. Uh, that's. Uh, uh, but uh, being uh, being totally serious, uh, that's uh, 
uh, there's been many, many shifts. It's like a sinusoid of different events, and you have went through all of them. You've been either directly involved or you were able to watch basically every change that went through the m music industry as we know it right now. And one of the most interesting changes that have been happening uh, recently is the resurgence of vinyl, vinyl and generally the analog sound. Do you have any opinion on that and do you maybe cherish that uh, I, I, unexpected I, change? I, I welcome the, uh, the resurgence of, of vinyl enormously because it means that people are you know, they're putting the record on, they're sitting down and they're going to go and listen to a, you know, a 20 minutes of music. Um, and that's, uh, that's something which for, for most people has, has completely gone away. I mean, uh, th th when they're on their computers or their smartphones, they're, they're just punching in three minute songs by different artists. You know, it's like a, it's like a mishmash of stuff. But uh, if, if they've bought a vinyl record and they play it, that means that they, they probably have a decent speaker, a decent set of speakers, a decent amplifier at home. Yeah. Um, I don't think anybody's listening to vinyl through little white earbuds. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that doesn't doesn't really make sense. That doesn't make sense. But do you think it's more motivated by nostalgia, simply because people see it's something that's vintage and it's just a fashion, or just that generally maybe analog is the way to go and it's better than digital? Not only in terms of the uh, product, but also just the sound, the quality, and depth. I mean, uh, hi-fi what we call hi-fi enthusiasts will we'll, we'll have always uh, felt that vinyl was, um, was the winner in terms of sound quality. But digital, uh, digital audio is still quite young. It hasn't been around that long. It's started in, what, the, the early 80s. And um, it's, it's improving all the time. We've, we've found uh, ways to uh, get rid of some of the artifacts that are normally associated with... Uh, with digital records and one day we will look back and laugh at, uh, at people who said analog was better because um, clearly we can uh, there will come a time when you, you won't be able to tell the difference because of advances in technology and uh, understanding hearing um, having said that we're uh, currently in a really bad situation with uh, uh, mp3 downloads being considered the norm and being considered okay as far as I'm concerned, it's absolutely not okay. And I, I look forward to the day when uh, people will realize that uh, high, higher bit rates, higher sample rates, uh, bigger files uh, are the way to go. And I think, uh, honestly, I think that uh, one of the most crucial changes in this uh, series of events is basically the fact that Billboard magazine and other, other you know, like, uh, uh, sound scan companies have started counting streams, music streams as album sales. Mm -hmm. And the number of streams is largely greater than music that is basically purchased. Uh, but uh, just to kind of like loosen up uh, for the very end, uh, right now at the very end, we're here in Doina Charlotte, here in Poland. Um, and you gotta admit that it's a pretty unusual place for a rock and roll show. Uh, have, you, have you been enjoying your stay here? It's been uh, wonderful. We, um, we actually uh, had uh, two full days off here, which was wonderful. Um, we uh, did a, sh a short tour in Germany before coming here. And it's been absolutely wonderful. I mean, great, uh, great surroundings, great, uh, beautiful lakeside restaurants and uh, really super beach areas, which we, we spent a, an afternoon on the beach uh, day before yesterday. It was, it was really, really lovely. Can't wait to come back. And uh, we're in great, uh, great company. Uh, we, all over the hotel you see f photos of all the acts who have appeared here. So I'm looking forward to being added to that, uh, to that wall of fame. <laughs>